Hey, what's going on, Indy Metro Church? Thanks for joining us on our virtual Sunday morning gathering on this extremely cold uh, January morning. Our scripture reading for today is found in the book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. The Apostle Paul writes this, You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit, who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his of his grace expressed in, its, in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And th this isn't from yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So if you weren't able to be with us last week, we started off 2024 by setting a discipleship goal together as a church. And this discipleship goal is really encapsulated from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 42. We read this, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And this verse, it, it really encapsulates uh, what our goal is as, as a church for 2024. This is a vision for who we want to be in Christ Jesus as well. In, in 2024, I want the people of Indy Metro to be devoted to spending regular time reading scripture, to prioritize meeting together on Sundays, to be connected in relationship with each other throughout the week, and have a consistent rhythm of prayer. I want this to be true of us, not, not so that we can feel self-righteous, not in an attempt to earn our good favor and our good standing before God, but because we understand the importance of excelling in the basics. See, I, I can't stress this enough. My, my goal isn't that we all look the same and that we're all doing the exact same things. My goal is that we're all pursuing the same vision together. So how you go about pursuing this vision is going to be as various as the people in our church are. So you know yourself, you know your, your strengths, your weaknesses, you know your tendencies. The, the, the point is that each one of us are pursuing this vision together. Over the next four weeks, what I want to do is I want to zoom in on each one of these four characteristics of the early church. And I want, to cons I want us to consider how within the context of our own lives, we can learn from the example of the early church and then apply these lessons in our own discipleship journeys. And so with that being said, the, this morning, what I want to do is I want to uh, zoom in and, and focus on the first characteristic of the early church as described in Acts 2.42. This morning, we're focused on how the early church were devoted to the apostles' teaching. For our, for our context today, uh, that just means uh, that we are people who are devoted to Scripture reading. One of, the, one of the ways that my brother and I have, have recently bonded and we've stayed connected throughout, throughout the week is by sharing like stupid Facebook reels and YouTube shorts and, and Facebook posts with each other that we just think are funny and humorous is kind of a way to, I don't know, you know, stay connected and, and make each other laugh. And uh, I fell, I found this, this recent post and I sent it to my brother earlier this week. And, and in this post, this person obviously has greatly misunderstood the, the, the proper engine temperature. And this is what this post says. It says, all right, guys, bit of a dilemma. My BMW refuses to warm up fully. It only gets about halfway before stopping. Uh, I've narrowed it down to two possible reasons. One, I have too much coolant in the system and I need to drain it about halfway so that it'll heat up the other halfway. And two, the previous owner must have installed a cold air intake and now it only gets cold air. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Like, yikes, right? I mean, some mechanic is, is going to be making a lot of money off of this person pretty soon, right? See, when we don't properly understand something... We, we can end up getting ourselves into tough situations. We can get ourselves into places that we don't want to be. We can end up just making a mess of things. And that's certainly true in our discipleship journey as well. 
See, if, if our hope for a church in 2024 is, be, is to be a people who marinate on Scripture, that, that we are regularly considering and thinking about the gospel, trying to apply it to our daily lives, then, then I would suggest that we first have to make sure that we are properly understanding the gospel. In, in our text today, the Apostle Paul gives us a framework for discussing two of the most common misunderstandings with regards to our faith. See, just like each one of us will be different in how we pursue our discipleship goal, each one of us are going to be different in how we misunderstand the gospel. We're not all going to struggle in the same ways when it comes to putting it into practice because of our unique backgrounds and life experiences, because of our our different temperaments, because we had different upbringings, because some of us grew up in a faith tradition and others didn't grow up in a faith tradition. Some of us have struggled with different things in the past or we've given ourselves over to doing what's wrong. We each have different insecurities and fears and life ambitions, right? Each of us, we we are going to be tempted to misunderstand and misapply the gospel within the details of our lives in different ways. So using our text as a guide, what we're going to explore this morning is that some of us struggle to understand the gospel because what what we really struggle with is understanding sin, on the other hand, some of us, we, we struggle to understand the gospel because what we really struggle with is understanding grace. Some of us, we struggle with sin. Some of us, we struggle with grace. So it's my hope that this morning helps us to, to better understand ourselves so that we can better allow the truth of God's kingdom to come into focus within our lives as we're reading the Bible consistently throughout this new year together. In other words, by understanding how each of us are going to be tempted in unique ways to misunderstand the gospel, it's my hope that each of us can more effectively engage with Scripture as we pursue the Lord together in 2024. So that's where we're going in our time together this morning. So from wherever you're at right now, will you please join me in a posture of prayer? Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for... um, the technology to stay connected even when we can't be together physically, Lord. Um, Help us to understand that this is certainly not the norm, that this is, um, even in our discipleship goals, as one of our goals being in fellowship with each other, Lord, that it's, we're, we're grateful that we can be connected right now, but at the same time, help us to long for being together uh, next week even more. Um, Help us to, to not, just put it on cruise control for this coming week, but help us to, to be fully engaged this morning. Help us to consider what you're doing in the movement of our lives. Help us to know how we can p- work together as a church to pursue you um, throughout this coming year. May each of us put um, Acts chapter 2, verse 42 into our memory as a verse that we just know by heart so that we can better pursue you as a church this year. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Uh, so first, when, when it comes to living out the gospel, some of us struggle to understand the severity of sin. Uh, our text today starts off by saying this. Paul writes, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Let's take a moment and notice what, what Paul does not say. He didn't say you were in trouble because of your sins or you needed to get your act together because of your sins. What, what did Paul actually say? He said, we were dead because of our sins. We were dead, right? Without Jesus, the game was already over. Regarding this verse, uh, John Piper puts it this way. He says, without Christ, we are in the morgue, not the doghouse. This is the human condition. We are completely dead in our sins. See, so often we can find ourselves in positions of, of trying to achieve, of, of adding things onto our faith because we don't understand how truly stuck and enslaved we are without God, right? Deep inside, part of us still believes that we have some sort of control when it comes to our redemption and our restoration. We can incorrectly end up thinking that, that with, without Jesus, we're, instru- we're, we're just in trouble instead of understanding that without Jesus, we're dead. When we fall in, into this trap of misunderstanding, we end up believing that, that we have what it takes to fix ourselves, that we can do enough good things in order to make up for the bad things, that we can be very religious, that we can be devoted to God um, through 
fervor and zeal and somehow we can earn our salvation through that. We, we believe that by our own strength, we can break that sinful habit on our own. So without realizing, we, we start saying that our salvation is Jesus plus something else, like Jesus plus our own effort or Jesus plus our own strength. And the reason that we do this is because some of us don't understand the severity of sin. Friends, we aren't in trouble without Jesus. Without him, we are immovably stuck. We are already dead. See, sometimes you and I, we strive to do good things, not because we're attempting to worship God, but because we, we misunderstand sin. We incorrectly think that we can free ourselves when we really can't. It's only through the finished work of Jesus Christ that our sin is defeated. On the other hand, sometimes our misunderstanding of sin can lead us like sort of to the opposite end of the behavior spectrum, right? Instead of self-righteously striving to do good because we misunderstand sin, instead we allow ourselves to be swept along by what we know is, is bad. We, we can sort of develop this overly relaxed attitude towards sin, right? Because of Jesus, my sin isn't that big of a deal anymore. Like he solved that problem for me. So, so why worry about it? We, we can sort of compromise our moral integrity because, hey, it's just human nature or nobody's perfect. We don't allow God's call to holiness to be something that we take seriously. We end up making allowances for our sin. We even justify that our sin isn't even that bad. In Romans 3, 5 through 8, we, we read this. But some might say our sinfulness serves a good purpose for it helps people see how righteous God is. Isn't it unfair then for him to punish us? Of course not. If, if God were not entirely fair, how would he be qualified to judge the world? But someone might still argue, how can God condemn me as a sinner if my dishonesty highlights his truthfulness and brings him more glory? Some people even slander us by claiming that we say the more we sin, the better it is. Those people who say such things deserve to be condemned. See, to properly understand the gospel, we have to always keep at the forefront of our minds the price that Jesus willingly paid for us. It was only through Jesus coming to the earth, living a perfect life that we could not, allowing himself to stand in our place and to die for us that our sin is defeated when we as followers of Jesus, when we willfully participate in what we know is not of God's kingdom, then what we end up doing inadvertently instead of showing God gratitude is that we subconsciously just show him contempt and disdain. Even though we, we might not consciously be thinking about it, in those, vo- in those moments, Jesus is becoming nothing more than a vehicle of our salvation. He is certainly not the Lord of our lives. He's just a means to an end. Friends, to properly understand sin, we have to remember that it's horrible. That it has never in any way contributed to our peace or to goodness or to wholeness in, what, in, in any way whatsoever. When we're tempted to sin, so often we're thinking about how sin could be pleasurable. It could be good. We have to remember that it's not. It's not good. It's because of sin that we were separated from God. We also have to keep in mind the prevalence of sin. In our text today, Paul describes that we're engaged in a multi-front battle, that there are three different channels in which we are tempted with sin. In our text, we read, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, right? That, there, there's one way, the world tempts us to sin. And of the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient. That's a second thing, right? The devil tempts us to do evil. And all of us used to live among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. That's three, right? Our, our own hearts, our own desires are drawn towards doing what's wrong. When it comes to our discipleship journey, we, we cannot afford to have a relaxed attitude towards sin. We, we can't afford to not take it seriously. We must understand that when it comes to temptation, there's a spiritual component, an external component, and an internal component all at work, like trying to misguide us to misapply the gospel. If we hope to be people devoted to studying God's word together in 2024, then 
then we must read the Bible through the lens of the severity of sin. That without Jesus, we are hopelessly trapped. We are enslaved. We are dead. In our text today, Paul, he's painted a, a pretty bleak picture so far, right? So the question quickly becomes, so is there any hope? What hope is there? Well, the, the next word in our text, I think, captures the heart of the gospel maybe better than any other single word in the entire Bible. To me, for my own reflection, this might be the single most powerful word in the Bible. But, but, right, all, the, all the things that Paul said about sin so far, that's only half the story. Sin doesn't get the last word. The last word belongs to the Lord. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you've been saved. See, friends, some of us, we're going to struggle to apply the gospel in our lives because we misunderstand sin. But some of us, we're going to struggle to apply the gospel in our lives because we misunderstand grace. Friends, sin, sin is powerful. We, we have to take it seriously. But God's love for us, His grace offered through Jesus Christ, it's even more powerful. It, it deserves to be taken even more seriously. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions, it's, been great, it's by grace you've been saved. So what's the cure to sin? Listen again, Colossians 2, 13 through 14. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. But God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. What's the remedy What's the cure for sin? Listen again. Isaiah 53, 5 through 6. He was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. But the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. Friends, that's the gospel message. We are alive because of God's grace. We are alive See, some of us struggle to understand that good news. We, we struggle to take God's grace seriously. We struggle to understand that through the finished work of Jesus Christ, you have nothing left to prove. There's, there's nothing left to do. You are alive. See, here's an interesting fact. The symptoms of misunderstanding grace are nearly identical to the symptoms of misunderstanding sin. When we misunderstand grace, we also find ourselves in positions of striving to achieve, of adding things onto our faith because we don't understand how truly alive and free that we are with Jesus. Deep inside, Parvis still believes that we have some sort of role to play when it comes to our redemption and our, and, and our restoration we incorrectly believe that in order to be acceptable to God, we need to fix ourselves. We need to be people who do good things in order to make up for the bad things or that we have to be very religious, that, that it's only through our devotion and zeal that God will accept us. We believe that the Lord expects us to break that sinful habit or routine on, his own, on our own. Sort of like, hey, when you get that figured out, then you can approach me. And without realizing it, we start adding things onto our faith, right? It's Jesus plus my effort. It's Jesus plus my good works that I'm accepted and the reason that we do this is because we don't understand God's grace. See, when we misunderstand sin, we end up thinking, I have the power to save myself. But when we misunderstand grace, we end up thinking, I have a role to play in saving myself. Friends, here's the good news of the gospel. Only God has the power to rescue you out of your slavery to sin and death. And because of his great love for you, he's more than willing to do it. Verse 8 of our text says, For it's by grace you've been saved through faith. And this isn't from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. Well, continuing on, just like with misunderstanding sin, sometimes our misunderstanding of grace can lead us to the opposite end of, this, of the behavior spectrum, right? 
we can struggle with having this overly relaxed attitude towards God's love for us because, hey, because of Jesus, it doesn't really matter what I do. God's going to save me no matter what. So I don't need to really stress out about trying to do the right thing. Instead of striving to do good, we give ourselves over to doing what's wrong because, hey, I'm saved by grace. Romans 6, 1 through 2 and 11 says, Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Count yourself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, when when we misunderstand sin, we think, hey, doing what's wrong, cooperating with death, that's not that big of a deal. But when we misunderstand grace, we end up thinking doing what's right, leaning into this new life with Jesus, and that's not really that big of a deal. The symptoms of misunderstanding grace and misunderstanding sin are almost identical. So what about you? Which one of these do you think that you probably struggle with the most? Do you struggle to fully comprehend the severity of sin? Do you find yourself striving to do good things because in your pride, you believe that you have the power to defeat the slavery to sin and death that you're currently in? Do you find yourself doing what you know that you should not, justifying this behavior by comparing yourself to other people or rationalizing, hey, no one's perfect? Jesus has forgiven me of so much already. So what's one more sin on the stack really going to make a difference for? Does that describe you? Maybe you find yourself on the other end. Maybe what you really struggle with is, is comprehending God's love and grace towards you. Maybe the inner monologue of your life is almost always condescending and condemning towards yourself. Do you, do you find yourself striving to do good things because you just cannot accept that in your current state, God could love you, that you have, you have to clean yourself up before you're acceptable to God? Are you trying to earn the Lord's affection, hoping that you can eventually do enough good so that you can be welcomed into his kingdom? Maybe you end up leaning into things that you know aren't good, that they're anti-God's kingdom, because honestly, you're just trying to distract yourself from that inner monologue, from that condemnation that you're constantly are feeling. So you self-medicate by doing things that you know that you shouldn't be doing so that you can distract yourself from how unworthy you feel. Do you believe that God's grace at the end of the day is more of a loophole that now God has to save you because of Jesus? Instead of God desiring you, desiring your redemption, desiring your restoration. And that's why he went to such great lengths to make it happen. Do you believe that God has to save you because of Jesus or that he wants to save you because of his great love? See, regardless of where you fall on that spectrum, the result of misunderstanding sin and misunderstanding grace is what we end up doing is just misunderstand our purpose here right now in this life. Paul writes this in verse six of our text says, God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Friends, you've heard me say this before as your pastor, but I think it's definitely worth repeating here. If we're going to properly understand the gospel, then we have to understand that through Jesus, we aren't simply saved from something. We're also saved to something. As followers of Jesus, we get the privilege of having foretaste of God's kingdom right here and now. We get the privilege of participating with God as he's revealing his kingdom. Our eternal life with Jesus isn't something that's going to start when we die. Our eternal life with Jesus has already begun. We get to be generous with our resources. We get to have the privilege of self-sacrificial love. We are empowered to forgive those people who have wronged us. We're being transformed into people who crave God's presence. Friends, understanding the gospel and applying it to our lives means that we're following in Jesus' footsteps. We're loving other people. We're doing good. We don't have to do good works in order to defeat sin. We don't have to do good works in order to be accepted. 
we understand that through, through the finished work of Jesus Christ, sin has already been defeated. We are already fully welcomed and accepted. And that truth releases us to joining with God in his mission of making his great love for the world known. <coughs> so as we make an effort to prioritize scripture reading during 2024, let's never lose sight of the, of the Bible's primary message. Sin is more powerful than, than we are. We can't defeat sin. It's more powerful than we are. But God is more powerful than sin. That God loves us so much that he held nothing back when it comes to our rescue. That he loves us so much that he didn't just save us from sin, he adopted us as his children. That he loves us so much that he's teaching us right here and right now what his kingdom's all about. He's allowing us to partner with him in bringing heaven to earth. We haven't simply been saved. Through Jesus Christ, we've been given purpose. So as we start to close, my my hope for us here at Indy Metro in the new year is that we are a church devoted to reading Scripture, but that we do so through the right lens. Sin is horrifically bad. We can't trust it. We can't beat it on our own. But grace is more powerful than sin, more powerful than we would dare to dream. (coughs) Our sin stands no chance. God will prevail. My hope is that you read scripture through this lens that God truly loves you, that he truly cares about you, that your salvation isn't a loophole. Your salvation has occurred because God loves to love you. And finally, maybe we remember that our eternal life has already begun in Christ Jesus, that we get to partner with God here and now as he continues to make himself known to the world. So so throughout this coming year, let's invest ourselves in the scripture, knowing that God is continuing to make himself known as we're investing ourselves into scripture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you uh, again for the ability to be bonded together, not just with you, but with each other as a church. May we Look forward to meeting together in person next week, but may may we invest ourselves this week into knowing who you are. May we read the Bible through the right lens. For the people who struggle with understanding the severity of sin, I pray that you would would help them to to get their eyes um, and focus on the good. For the people who uh, struggle to understand your grace, Lord, may, may their eyes get off of the condemnation and may they put it on to you, the good. So regardless of where we are in the spectrum, regardless of where we are in our discipleship journeys, Lord, may you continue uh, to make yourself known that you love us, that you've redeemed us and you've restored us through the finished work of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we start to transition to a time of taking communion together, I'm going to put some reflection questions up so that we can each consider what God might be calling us to do this week. So let's spend some time in reflection.
on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gave us um, a concrete symbols to show us not only how severe sin was, but most importantly, how overwhelmingly constant and powerful his love is. Jesus gave us the bread that represents his body broken and, and the juice that represents his blood shed. He gave us these elements to show us that there is nothing in heaven and earth that would stop him from pursuing a relationship with us. Friends, there's nothing in this universe that stops God from pursuing a relationship with you. My invitation for us as a church is to pursue a relationship with God. In 2024, one of our goals is to be a people devoted to reading Scripture because we want to be a people devoted to pursuing God. So let's take the bread, let's eat it together, let's remember that what this represents is the, is the sacrifice, the price that, that Christ willingly paid for our redemption, the body of Christ broken for you. Likewise, Jesus took a cup and he passed it among his friends. He said, this is the blood of the new covenant. It says in scripture that without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. And Jesus said, well, then take mine, take mine so that we can be forgiven. Friends, isn't that good news? That Jesus loves you, the blood of the new covenant. Jesus Christ, we humbly thank you for loving us. Help us to respond and to love you back, not so that we're accepted, but as a response to the good news that we already are. It's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us um, on our virtual Sunday morning gathering this week. Uh, just a few quick announcements before we go. First of all, uh, a total for the big give, if you haven't seen already, just blown away and humbled. Um, our goal is $12,000. Uh, you, you all gave $26,500. Uh, so what that means is that not only are we going to continue our partnership with Love Guatemala and continue to support Pastor Ben Kunkel um, with uh, his, his efforts in, in planting new churches, we're also going to be able to continue to, to pay down uh, the small mortgage that we have on the building that um, just as good stewards of resources. So thank you, uh, genuinely thank you for your generosity in responding to uh, the gospel in that way. Uh, secondly, next week, uh, the 21st, uh, immediately after service, we're going to have uh, an all members meeting meeting where um, we'll, we'll kind of do uh, an annual review of 2023 and, and also presenting the budget and some other um, clarifications about the discipleship goals. So just feel free to, to, um, to or please don't just feel free, please come <laughs> spend, spend an extra 15 to 20 minutes after church, making sure that you uh, understand uh, the ins and outs of, of where we're going and where we've been um, not only financially, but also spiritually as well. Um, you can continue to worship God with your giving by going to indymetroorg slash give and making an online gift there. Um, so yeah, we love you. Thank you. Have a great week.